So today we're going to cover QNAP's Q Firewall. This is the built-in firewall designed to add protection to your NAS. If you're interested to see how this thing is configured and set up, then stick around and watch the rest of this video. And please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notifications icon. If you've viewed any of my other security videos on QNAPs or you've read anything about QNAP security concerns, then you might have run into some information on Q Firewall. Maybe you even tried it yourself. Either way, you may have come to the conclusion that it's not really all that straightforward. So today we're going to take and break it down, set it up, troubleshoot it, including capturing some packets to try to better understand what's going on and then create some rules to give us the best possible control over who and what has access to the NAS. So before we get any deeper into the setup, let's first talk about what QNAP firewall is and what it isn't. To begin with, it's not an internet firewall designed to protect your entire network. It's really only a limited firewall designed to protect your NAS. And if you have more than one NAS, you're gonna to have to configure each NAS separately. Now you can import and export profiles, which will save you a, bu a bunch of time, but you just have to understand that it's limited to NAS units. So if you don't have Q Firewall installed, the first thing we have to do is actually download it and install it. So let's walk through the basic configuration. So we're gonna go ahead and open this for the first time. It's gonna start the configuration process, at least the default configuration process. So our first screen just kind of tells you it's going to integrate into some of the functions that are in the NAS. But if you decide later on to uninstall it, those functions won't stay there. It'll be, they'll be removed. So let's go ahead and hit next. We're going to select the basic protection because as you'll see later on, this is actually going to get changed quite a bit and we'll end up probably creating our own profile. At least in my case, I had to create my own profile. Hit next. Here we're going to select a region. So for me, I'm in the United States, so I'll pick that. Hit next. And the last screen is finish. So when you're done, you're kind of prompted with uh, three default rules that it's created for you. One is the basic that we've enabled. And then we have one that includes subnets only. And we have restricted security, which we'll cover those briefly. But as you see, when we start creating our own profile, it's kind of all going to make some sense. For starters, let's just take a quick look at what's in here. So if I click on edit, it's created some default rules for me. When you first look at this, it's a little confusing, but when we break it down, it hopefully will make some more sense here. So we'll get back to this in a little bit when we start figuring out what this all means and how to make it work. So the first thing you want to do after you install it is click on firewall events. Now, you're already going to see that this thing's already flagging errors. It's a little confusing at first to try and figure out where these, where these warnings are coming from. So we're going to walk through how to actually capture the packets, understand what it's telling us, and then make some rules or modify some rules to get rid of these. We're going to let this run for about an hour or so, then we can see how many events have actually taken place, and then we'll go through the troubleshooting steps of how to isolate what those events are. Because Q Firewall doesn't give you a lot of information. So while we wait, let's go through some of the explanation of the rules and what they're actually doing. The default rules do several things. First, the application rule automatically creates rules based on applications such as, you know, Plex virtualization or a number of installed apps that you might have on your NAS unit. The second is designed for IP protection. So anything that gets logged and blocked based on numerous access or anything like that, it will create a rule that blocks that IP address. So if none of that happens, these rules will just sit there and not do a whole lot. So before we get into the rest of the rules and before we make any changes at all, it's really smart to clone or duplicate the profile you're using. So just in case things get really messed up, you can just delete it and go back to the basic profile and kind of restore the out of the box configuration. So to do that, we're going to go over here to the triple dots and we're going to hit duplicate. We're going to give it a name, whatever you want it to be and click apply. Save 
Yes. So now we've got a basic protections mod. We have a, a duplicate rule of the first one. So we're actually going to enable this one because that's the one we want to use and test. You don't have to do this step, but this just makes a lot easier, at least in my experience, since I had to go through a lot of tests and trials and errors to get things working correctly. So now that we've cloned the profile, let's dig into some of the other rules. These are editable and based on your current configuration may require a little bit of massaging or modifications. The other thing we need to understand about these rules is that they run from top to bottom. And at a minimum, we need to have at least two rules in here. Now you may have a lot more, but at minimum you need a lot to have at least two. And the first one is a, is a rule that allows access to your local devices. So if we look at this, this basically allows via adapter two, and this can be changed to any, but in my configuration, I'm using adapter two on any subnet. So any device that has a 192.168.0. anything address, on any protocol will be allowed to communicate to the NAS. And the second mandatory rule that you want is a deny rule, which is the last rule. It always has to be the last rule. So if we take a look at that rule, we'll see that it's set up to deny on all interfaces, any protocol. So basically what happens is if some other device requests a access to the NAS, it will first look to see if it's a local device. If it's a local device, it will allow it through. If it's not a local device, it'll look to the next rule and the next rule until it runs out of rules and then it gets to the deny rule and it'll block it. So as this is configured out of the box, only local devices will access it and anything in the U.S. will be allowed to come in. That's how it's configured out of the box. We're probably not going to leave it that way. So now that we got a little bit of an understanding of the basic rules and how they work, let's take a look at that packet capture and then start making some modifications to stop getting a bunch of false positives on this NAS unit. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of events that have taken place and now we're at the point where we actually need to troubleshoot. So the first thing that I normally do to isolate the problem is we need to understand where these events are coming from, what's causing it, it could also be coming from external to the network, which you'll see in my particular case, and then we'll figure out what to do about it. So the first thing you're going to want to do is capture the events. So this has its own packet capture, which is really kind of helpful, because that way at least we can capture the packets coming in and try to understand which IP addresses or which devices it's coming from, and then create a rule or adjust a rule accordingly. So we're going to go ahead and hit Start Capture. And it's going to basically start capturing a packet. Now, in order to view the packet capture, unfortunately, they don't give you a viewer. You need to download Wireshark. And I'll add a link to the description below so you can go right to their download site, install Wireshark, and then you'll be able to actually open up and view these files. So I'm going to go ahead and let this run. We'll uh, come back and take a look at the contents of the capture file and see if we can start making some headway into isolating these events. Once we stop the packet capture file, you want to hit save and it's going to download it to your defaults download directory. So if we take a look at this particular setup here, I've copied them over to a separate directory so that we can view them with Wire Wireshark. If I double click on the PCAP, which is the packet capture file, you can see that it loads up a whole bunch of events. And if we take a look at these events, they're almost all coming from the same place, which is our first clue. So if we take a look at this, you can see that from IP 10.81.234.6, I'm just getting constant pings onto the NAS, which the firewall is saying, hey, I don't know who this is, and I'm going to go ahead and block it. Now, by default, some of the basic rules it creates is that it allows local land access. However, this 10.81 address is not a local LAN. It actually turns out to be, in my case, an external VPN. So I've got a dedicated VPN connection to my system that I keep at work so that I can access my home files. And it's running all the time. So therefore, what it's seeing is it's seeing an external IP address, which is not in my current subnet. So it's not under 192.168. 
it's actually something different. And QNAP is blocking it, which is good. It's supposed to block it because it doesn't understand and it knows that it's not a local LAN. However, it's an acceptable IP address and we need to actually allow this to go through. So now let's get into figuring out how we allow this to go through. So we're going to go into our modified profile and we're going to say add rule. So the first thing we're going to do is say allow. Interface, we can leave to all or we can set it to the specific default adapter that you're using for, you know, most of us only are running one adapter at a time. So you can isolate it to that one adapter. That's fine. And the source is going to be an IP address. So we know what that IP address is. Now, this is a VPN DHCP. So I could put in the one address, which would solve my issues. But I also probably want to not have flags going forward. So what I probably want to do is I want to create a range because I know that the VPN allows a certain amount of IP addresses to be released. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say range and I'm going to type in that range that we saw and everything that the VPN allows to go through. So I'm going to say 81, 234, 5 to 10, 81, 234, 55. So basically what we're saying here is allow on adapter to any access in this IP range from a dot five to a dot 55 for any protocol. So let's hit apply. Now, one of the problems, or it's not a problem, we just have to know that it's there, is that it creates all the rules at the bottom. And as we mentioned earlier, the, the last rule has to be this deny. So therefore, this rule actually has to move up. Now, what I typically do is move it to the top, um, right below the application and IP protection. So that way, it's the first sequence that it hits when the VPN requests access to the NAS. It's going to go through that first rule. It's going to be allowed to go through, and it's not going to create any events. So then we'll hit apply, say yes. So now we've created that particular rule. Now we can go back through and start monitoring events again. And again, you're going to want to let this run for a while. It's going to see if it should tell you within the hour or so if it's going to create any amount of excessive events. And the reason I say an hour is because that's the default setting for, for exceeding the allowable number of hits or denials. So you may really have to do this a couple times until you find the right balance of eliminating events and actually providing you with the protection that you need to. And if you got lucky and you've done everything right, you might see something like this where there's really zero blocks taking place without having to, you know, create a wide open rule. That's not the intent here. However, there's most likely going to be cases, and I'll show you one on one of my NAS units, where there are events taking place and I have not been able to locate where they're coming from other than the fact that they're coming from my internal network and most likely from the NAS itself, probably through a third-party app or something like that. But as I troubleshoot or continue to troubleshoot, what I want to do is continue to block those, but I want to work on the notifications. So let me show you that one of my NAS units is actually still producing a what higher than comfortable amount of blocks and notifications throughout the day or throughout the hour. And that can get annoying if your phone keeps going off and you start getting notifications that you've exceeded the default 30. Now, remember these events are, are not necessarily a problem. They are potentially blocking something that needs to be accessed. You wanna err on the side of caution, which means you don't wanna just w make things wide open so that you don't get any events. You wanna continue to log these events while you determine what's causing them. That said, you want to also get rid of the notifications. And you can do that pretty simply by going up here to settings. And under firewall events, you can alter a couple of the parameters. So you can either lower the default log time, or you can change down here the amount of events that can take place before a notification goes out. Now, I've made mine really high because I'm troubleshooting and I want to I don't want to keep getting the notifications. I'd prefer to just go back here and look at the firewall events back and forth without sending, you know, hundreds of notifications out. 
So this is still an ongoing process. I've lowered it significantly from the firewall rules that I've showed you how to create. So it's no longer blocking uh, the VPN access. It's no longer blocking some other internal activities I got going on. But I still have a couple that are taking place. So I'm going to leave them because, again, we prefer to err on the side of conservatism and actually block the events until we completely understand what they are. So overall, I think Q Firewall is a great start. It's providing better security because no matter how secure the OS is or how secure it becomes, when you have multiple apps and a whole lot of other variables going on, you can always be vulnerable. So having a firewall that actually directly protects your source is actually a great idea. Um, they really should have come out with this a long time ago. I truly like what they're trying to do with this. And for the most part, it's pretty easy to set up rules, at least, you know, the obvious ones. My main complaint is basically in the complexity when troubleshooting. For most of us, it would be helpful if it was a simplified way of viewing the events in a way to get some information from the log sheets without having to resort through a third-party program. The fact that I have to run a capture file and download a third-party app like Wireshark is a little bit intimidating because um, it really tells you a whole lot more than you want to probably know. As the target for QNAP isn't necessarily the uh, network administrator, providing us with a whole lot more detail on these events would be a really big help. So if you're one of the few people that doesn't need to do a lot of troubleshooting and everything just kind of works out of the box, then you'll find it really easy to use. Otherwise, it's going to take a little bit of effort on your part to actually narrow down all these events and figure out what's going on. The only actual bug I found when I was using the software is actually takes place in the deny all rule at the bottom. I found that when I tried to make changes to it, that sometimes it wouldn't let me save my changes. And if I deleted the rule and tried to recreate it, it would tell me that the rule already exists. It didn't happen all the time, but it happened enough to make it annoying. The only real way out of this was to actually delete the entire profile and recreate the duplicate default profile and start over again. This didn't happen that often, but it, like I said, it's enough to make it annoying, especially when you're you know, making a lot of changes and trying to troubleshoot stuff. Anyway, if you end up using this, I'd love to hear about your experiences. So please post any questions or, or feedback on, on what you found and um, how well the software's worked for you in the comments below. I'd like to hear from you. Please don't forget to subscribe and smash that notifications button so you'll be notified of any new content. And thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video.